Do I Revelation chapter 17 and 18 are about desolation and destruction. It's an interesting portion of scripture here. Revelation 17 and 18. Now I've given you a, an outline there. I've got an extra one just there on the seat there. Just a piece of paper there for you. Um, we, I'd given you the... Um, Revelation 5 to 19 before. This is just the outline that uh, is from one of the books I'm, I'm using. And uh, the outline for Revelation comes right from God himself. In uh, chapter 1, verse 19, he talks about the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Uh, so that's, that's the basic outline of the book of Revelation. Um, chapter 1 is John's vision of Christ. And then... Uh, Chapters 2 and 3, the things which are, is the messages to the seven churches. And then the rest of the book is the things which shall be hereafter. And that's what we've been looking at for a while. The, um, the notes on the back of that page are about those, chapters 5 to, to uh, 19, the wrath of the Lamb. I just pull different notes from different places and like to make them available to you in case you don't have these, these references. And... Uh, the Wrath of the Lamb on the back there is uh, Dr. Wilmington's notes, and he, uh, he, he relates it as seven uh, judgments of God during the book of Revelation. And uh, the ones we're looking at tonight are number four and five in uh, Revelation 17 and 18. Uh, really, these chapters kind of go back and describe the final world religion and world government. Just the, there's a lot of things going on during the tribulation, and you can't just, well, God didn't choose to just put it all one thing after another. He gives us the order that he, he chose there. And uh, chapters 17 and 18 give us what it's, what it's going to be, some of the things it's going to be like there uh, with uh, a, a world religion, going to be very uh, prominent, especially the first half of the tribulation. And uh, the world government, You've, everybody's heard of the Antichrist and the beast and those, uh, those people. And uh, that's what he's talking about here. So let's read chapter 17. And uh, you follow along as, as I read. Revelation chapter 17. Now, these are some, I'll use the word, some wild verses. <laughs> There's some really interesting things that uh, God tells us here. Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. And talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, 
and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. we we'll just stop reading there. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing portion of scripture. Uh, he's talking about two main characters here. Uh, first he invites them, he says, come and see. Uh, there's going to be some tremendous judgment it is going to happen. And the two main characters are the woman and the beast. And he tells us the woman there in verse 18, it's a, it's a city. It's Babylon. And uh, we, we often, uh, uh, we believe that it's, it has to do with Rome and the seven hills and so on. But it has to do with religion. Uh, right toward the beginning of time, uh, Satan made an imitation of what God does. Satan is a great counterfeiter. Uh, you've probably heard of Babylon. Uh, it was founded by a man named Nimrod. And uh, he, he had a wife named Semer, Semerimus. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. She claimed that her son was the Messiah, basically. That he fulfilled Genesis 3.15. She called herself the Queen of Heaven. Uh, her son, the, the, she, I, I'm not ex sure how to even say this. Uh, they put out the story that he was killed and resurrected after 40 days. And they, they worshipped the, the mother and the son. It's interesting, all around the world, in different religions, they worship the mother and the son. And, you know, Satan's counterfeits. The closer he can get to what God is doing, uh, the more he likes it. In fact, some people worship Mary, the mother and the son. But they worship wrongly because we're not supposed to worship her. We're supposed to worship the son. Um, anyway, it's interesting with Tammuz and, and Semiramis, uh, their worship included things like uh, ch exchanging colored eggs and displaying evergreen trees <laughs> after 40 days, you know, and so on. Babel, the word Babel means gate of God. When you see a word with El in it, a lot of times it's, Elo, you know, it's from Elohim or El Shaddai kind of a thing. Gate of God. Now when we use the word Babel, what do we mean? Confusion. And the reason it's confusion is because it's not the gate of God. <laughs> you know, it's like saying, this is a door and there's no door, you know, kind of thing. It, it's just confusion. And uh, Satan loves to cause confusion. He loves to, to make people think everything's complicated and hard. Uh, let me encourage you. Concentrate on what you know in the Bible. Concentrate on what you can understand. Don't worry about all the things that people say, oh, you know, this and that. And uh, Satan loves to cause confusion. And the Bible encourages us to just stick with the simplicity that's in Christ. And uh, he's talking here about uh, the religious Babylon, I guess you might say. God is going to judge that. This false religion that started way back, uh, Satan has used that to cause confusion. He'll especially use it in the first half of the, of the tribulation. The second character is the beast. Uh, this is the Antichrist. Uh, you need to notice that the beast carries the woman. The beast, the Antichrist, carries the woman. Verse 3 and verse 7 um, saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast and verse 7 uh, the beast that carrieth her which hath the seven heads and, and, and ten horns uh, the beast is using religion until he's done with it Then, if you noticed as we read by he's going to have his ten horns the ten kings destroy her he's going to get rid of religion in that sense and they'll just worship him um, he uses religion and he explains here in verse 15 that the, this horror sitting upon many waters, uh, verse 1, uh, verse 15 tells us that's peoples. That represents peoples. A lot of this is symbolic, uh, but uh, we can't just say everything's symbolic, but uh, a lot of it he, he explains. Uh, the ten horns are ten kings in verse 12. Uh, they're, they're ten kings who rule at the same time under, uh, uh, under the Antichrist and just for a, a, sh a short while. And it's interesting, and later on, they're the ones that are going to destroy this, this false religion, this whore, as the Bible refers to her. But 
They can't get away. Look at verse 17. They can't get away from God's will. It's uh, Revelation 17, 17. God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll do it for all kinds of different reasons. But the real reason they're going to do it is God said that's what's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, so you see, first of all, the destruction of the harlot, religious Babylon judged. Um, then in, in chapter 18, you see the destruction of the economic or political Babylon. Now, I'm not smart enough to know all the ins and outs of all this, but uh, I know this, Babylon is a real place, but it's also a symbol of man's rebellion against God. And uh, this combination of religion and politics and economics, um, you may not realize this, but the society we live in is one of the few in history that doesn't combine politics and religion in a real sense. Um, when the, a couple hundred years ago, if you were part of a country, you had to be part of their religion. And there's still a lot of countries like that. And it, it's going to go back to that at the beginning of the tribulation. And uh, then he's going to turn them just to, uh, just to worshiping him. But God is going to destroy not only uh, the religion, but the politics. He's going to destroy the beast and, and all of it. Let's, let's look at chapter 18 just a bit by bit here. Uh, After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Uh, the voice of condemnation. Uh, he cried mightily, Babylon is, is fallen. And um, then he goes on in verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewardeth you, and double unto her double, according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Uh, God's call for, uh, for separation. He says, don't, don't be a part of this. You don't want to be a part of this judgment uh, that's coming. Um, it's hard to know how to, how to say this with a, a mixed group and, and young people, but uh, he, he uses this sexual kind of a, of a thing, the whore and the harlot and, and so on. Uh, and it, it just made me realize, you know, God intends for us to have grace. He doesn't intend for us to have works. You know, we're not saved by works. And it, it's a false thing to think that we can, we can uh, please God by what, by our works. And he compares it to, to harlotry. To, anyway, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but God calls us to be separate from sin. Then in, uh, in verse 9, you might say the voice of lamentation. In verse 9, they, they bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off, verse 10, for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. The thing I want you to notice as I read this is they're not lamenting over sin. They're lamenting over Babylon being destroyed. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood 
and of brass and iron and marble. Boy, he goes on, doesn't he? And cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee. Thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. Uh, judgment, the, the voice of lamentation. Um, you know, if, if you're living for wealth, God says that's all going to be gone in, in an hour. Uh, it's just, it's not going to last. And... Uh, they're lamenting, but it's not over their sin. It's not over not having a relationship with God. It's, oh, our money's gone. The, uh, the city where we worked is gone. The, the things that we loved are gone. Well, in verse, verse 20, he says, Rejoice. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. If you look it up, that's found in Jeremiah 51. All the way back there, God, God had already said that this is, this is what's going to happen. Verse 22, And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of what... Uh, so ever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle uh, shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So great judgment as he talks here in, in chapters 17 and, and 18, uh, the destruction of Babylon, uh, the destruction of uh, the politics and the economics and the religions and you know, all the things that are going on that, uh, that uh, Satan has used and the, the Antichrist have, have used in, in rebellion against God. Uh, I think verse 24 uh, gives us the why um, when he says, I got the wrong chapter, in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Uh, they're, they're just getting what, what they deserve. Uh, earlier on he said they, they, they should get double uh, of what they, they gave. And uh, in these two chapters we see um, the, the world religion and the world government and economy just basically being destroyed. And this is God's judgment on the earth. I'm saying to Doyle today, uh, CNN will be having a great time uh, during all of this. Uh, I, I have no idea what it'll be like as far as that goes, but uh, you know, the, the earth, the, the people will have explanations for everything, I think, in a lot of this, and it's, it's amazing to see. I can't say I understand everything that's being said here, but I can understand the basics. Uh, God is going to judge sin, and uh, we need to make sure that we are uh, not uh, going against God. Uh, not trying to think that we can uh, earn or pay for something that we can only get by God's grace. Uh, in uh, chapter 17, verse 1, we need to remember that all of this judgment is the wrath of the Lamb. It's, it's such a strange statement that he makes earlier in Revelation, the wrath of the Lamb. You don't think of a Lamb as being angry and judging. Uh, all of this is, is God's judgment. And uh, it's like he says in, in Romans, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You know, we don't have to seek vengeance. Uh, God will even out the books. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I've, I've probably read this verse several times already in this study, but 
1 Thessalonians 1, verse 7. Second Thessalonians. Change my notes here. Second Thessalonians chapter one and verse seven. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. And the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. God's word is true. And we need to understand uh, there is wrath coming. And uh, we don't want to be uh, on that end of things. Uh, verse 20, rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets. For God hath avenged you on her. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And we see the wrath of the Lamb. And as well... In these chapters, you see that our commitment to the Lord is unto death. You know, it's not just a passing thing. I, I remember one lady, I can't remember the exact situation, but she was saying, I don't know why people don't just try Christianity. If they didn't like it, they could just, you know, they could just leave. <laughs> well, that's not the way it works, you know. Uh, when you commit your, your heart and your life to the Lord, it's, it's eternal. You know, it's, it's forever. Um, our commitment to Jesus is, is unto death. And that's, that's what he's talking about in uh, chapter 17, verse 6, for instance. Uh, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Uh, there's been people right through the ages uh, that have died because they, they trusted the Lord. Uh, there's still people today. You know, we don't, uh, the news doesn't like to talk about the, these kinds of things much. They'll talk about all kinds of things, but uh, they don't talk about religious persecution much when it's the Christians being, uh, being persecuted. There's people every day that are killed for Christ as we, as we live. Jesus said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. That's John 15, verse, verse 18. Uh, favorite verse of, of mine is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, when he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's, it's eternal. Our commitment to Jesus is is unto death. Uh, I remember, well, in uh, contrast, in chapter 18 and verses 17 and 19, uh, he talks about how they're gone in an hour. <laughs> you know, when judgment comes, all these things that they, people thought would last forever, uh, they're just gone. Uh, the great city. And the key to our relationship with Jesus is that Jesus' commitment to us is eternal. In chapter 17, the end of verse 8, it talks about who, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, he's expressing it in the negative there. But uh, later on, he talks about those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, his, his commitment to us is eternal. He, he puts it down in, in writing, so to speak. Uh, later in Revelation 20, verse 12, I guess it's still uh, negative. Uh, they open the books Book of Life, and the dead were judged out. Chapter 20, verse 15, Whosoever was not found written in the Book of Life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, there's a reason we ca God calls it eternal life. He's the eternal Savior. Uh, Jesus' commitment to us is eternal. And in Revelation 17, verse 14, there's victory in Jesus. They shall make, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Doesn't sound like much of a battle, you know, these kings fighting with a lamb, <laughs> but they don't even have a chance. Uh, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. That's the reason why he's victorious, is because of who he is. They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. It reminded me of Romans chapter 8, you know, where it talks about our, our relationship to the Lord, uh, whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And God's made a place for us in heaven. He's got our name in the Lamb's book of life. Now, even the devil can't resist the will of God. 
Now, that's good to know. It's good to keep that in mind. Even the devil can't resist the will of God. As we read there in chapter 17, verse 17, God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. You know, sometimes God will use wicked people to do his will. Sometimes um, a person will think, well, how can, how can God judge me with this? They're worse than I am. Well, that's just the way God works sometimes. Sometimes the devil will be doing God's will and, and not know it. Um, but the call for us, there is 18, chapter 4, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. Now, we're, we're not in the tribulation. We're probably pretty, pretty close to the end times. We, we don't know. It seems like it. Uh, but Satan is at work. Uh, Babylon is at work. You know, these, these things are, are philosophies and ideas that uh, are, are true now, that it will be uh, more exhibited then. Uh, this idea that uh, we can just make up our own religion, uh, that we can do what we want, and, and God just has to, has to like it or lump it. Uh, he, he says, come out of her, my people. We don't want to be a part of the world's religion. We don't want to be just controlled by the world's philosophies and uh, economy and politics. Uh, we need to be careful because we can get so involved in the culture that we forget that we have a, we have a Savior who tells us how to live. And uh, we need to ask ourselves, uh, we need to live not as citizens of Babylon, but as citizens of heaven. Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And that, that's, the, that's the key. That's the eternity that we need. It's not going to be found in houses and land. Um, it's not going to be found by putting out all the fires in Australia uh, or by having the best, better politicians or better programs. Uh, it's going to come as we live as citizens of heaven. And over and over in Revelation, he shows us judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And uh, th there's just no, no escaping it without the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way of escape. And I encourage you to be encouraged. You know, as, as the world gets worse around us, uh, we need to be reminded that uh, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I have hope. Therefore will I hope in him. Lamentations 3 something. <laughs> the Lord is my portion. Uh, you know, it's not the things that the world is offering us. It's the Lord. Anyway, I'll quit there. Revelation 17 and 18. Desolation and destruction. Uh, any comments or...